Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about Chapter 3, all about racial and ethnic inequality. Racial and ethnic discrimination are among the most diverse social problems facing the United States. A racial group is a category of people who have been singled out by others or themselves as inferior or superior on the basis of selected physical characteristics such as skin color, hair texture, or eye shape. By contrast, an ethnic group is a category of people distinguished by others or themselves as inferior or superior, primarily on the basis of culture or nationality. Race and ethnicity often form the basis of ranking between majority or dominant group members who are advantaged and have superior resources and rights. This is higher than minorities or subordinate group members who are subjected to unequal treatment by the dominant group. Prejudice is a set of negative attitudes towards members of another group simply because they are members of that group. It's rooted in what's called ethnocentrism, the assumption that one's own group and way of life is superior to all others. Symbolic interactionist perspectives assert that racial socialization is a process of social interaction that contains specific messages and practices concerning one's racial or ethnic status. Functionalist perspectives, assimilation, and ethnic pluralism focus on how members of subordinate groups become a part of the mainstream. Conflict theorists, on the other hand, analyze racial and ethnic inequality from class and gendered racism perspectives or in terms of internal colonialism or racial formation theory. The unique experiences of Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos and Latinas, and Asian and Pacific Americans are going to be examined in this chapter. By the time we are done with chapter three, you'll be able to do the following. Distinguish between the terms racial group and ethnic group and explain how official racial and ethnic classifications continue to change. Define racism, prejudice, ethnocentrism, stereotypes, individual discrimination, institutional discrimination, and anti-Semitism, and explain how these terms are related. Compare the following perspectives on racial and ethnic inequality social psychological, symbolic interactionist, functionalist, and conflict. Describe the unique historical experiences of Native American or American Indians and Alaska Natives that have contributed to problems of inequality. Explain how slavery, the racial division of labor, segregation, lynching, and persistent discrimination have contributed to inequality for African Americans. Describe the major categories of Latinos, Latinas, or Latinx, which is gender neutral for Hispanic Americans, and explain how internal colonialism, migration, and discrimination have affected their experiences in the United States. Identify the major categories of Asian Americans, Hawaiian Natives, and other Pacific Americans, and describe their unique historical and contemporary experiences. And finally, compare functionalist conservative, conflict liberal, and symbolic interaction solutions to the problems of racial and ethnic inequality. So let's first start off by distinguishing between the terms racial group and ethnic group and explain how quote unquote official racial and ethnic classifications continue to change. As I just talked about in the overview, when you talk about racial groups, these are people who have been singled out by either themselves or others as inferior or superior on the basis of real or alleged physical characteristics. Most often we identify different races by the color of their skin, but can also include hair texture, eye shape, or any other subjectively selected attribute. An ethnic group, on the other hand, is a group of people distinguished by others or themselves as inferior or superior, primarily based on the basis of cultural or nationality characteristics. An example of this could be when we look at racial groups, we focus a lot of time on skin color. For ethnic groups, we look at where's your country of origin? So what country or state do you come from? When we think about the, the official racial and ethnic classification, there's a couple of things that we need to think about. Before the Civil War, race was used to justify the subordination of African Americans. In some Southern states, persons were classified as African American based on what was called the one drop rule. Person with a trace of African blood 
was considered quote unquote black and treated as inferior. Being classified as Negro, black or colored had a profound effect on people's life chances and opportunities during slavery and the subsequent era of legally sanctioned segregation in the South. In the past, government racial classifications were based primarily on skin color. For the 2010 census, two questions were asked about Hispanic origin and race. People who identify their origin as Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish may be of any race, but it should be noted that these terms are often used interchangeably. This data is important for a number of reasons. One, this data is often considered when policy decisions are made. Two, this data is used in redistricting processes that are carried out by states and may have an effect on how congressional districts are drawn. And three, this data is used in monitoring how well local areas comply with Federal Voting Rights Act. When we think of dominant subordinate groups, we need to think of it from several perspectives. The terms majority group and minority group are widely used, but their meanings are less clear as the composition of the United States population changes. Accordingly, many sociologists prefer the terms dominant and subordinate to identify power relationships that are based on perceived racial, ethnic, or other attributes and identities. A dominant or majority group is one that is advantaged and has superior resources and rights in a society. Often, these groups are determined on the basis of race or ethnicity, but they can also be based on factors such as gender, sexual orientation, that is homosexuality, heterosexuality, or bisexuality, and physical ability. A subordinate or minority group is one whose members, because of physical or cultural characteristics, are disadvantaged and subjected to unequal treatment by the majority group and regard themselves as objects of collective discrimination. In the United States, persons of color, women, persons with disabilities or differing abilities, gay men and lesbians tend to be considered minority group members. Also in the United States, the racial and ethnic dominant group typically is associated with white skin privilege. Skin color has given white people an unearned advantage because they live in a society that values their socially constructed racial category over others and confers dominance to their group while identifying other categories as being subordinate. What we see here in figure 3.1 is the percentage of U.S. population by race and Hispanic origin. Something to note is that even though white is still considered the majority, we are starting to see that the rates of people who are identifying as, as uh, Hispanic or Latinx, um, black, Asian American is starting to raise or rise rather. In addition, it's estimated that by 2050, being white will no longer be the majority. Being Hispanic or Latinx will now be the majority. So let's look at racism, prejudice, and discrimination. Racism is a set of attitudes, beliefs, and practices used to justify the superior treatment of one racial or ethnic group and the inferior treatment of another racial or ethnic group. In the United States, racism is sometimes referred to as white racism, referring to socially organized attitudes, ideas, and practices that deny people of color the dignity, opportunities, freedoms, and rewards that typically are available to white Americans. Prejudice is a negative attitude based on faulty generalizations about members of a selected racial or ethnic group. Within prejudice is ethnocentrism. This is the assumption that one's own group and way of life are superior to all. Stereotypes can also fall in line with prejudice, but it's slightly different as stereotypes are overgeneralizations about the appearance behavior, or other characteristics of all members of a group. So something that we see here is that this is, and I'm going to butcher the name and I apologize, but this is Ibiza Muhammad. She's second from the left and was the first Muslim American woman to wear a hijab while competing for the United States in the Olympics. They won the bronze medal in the 2016 Sabre event. However, we don't see as much notoriety or we never really heard much about this because her being a Muslim American, 
is not as popular as other um, backgrounds, specifically white women, and the saber is not as popular of a sporting event as other sporting events in the United States. In addition to racism and prejudice, let's also talk about individual discrimination. This consists of one-on-one -on -one acts by members of the dominant group that harm members of the subordinate group or to their property. In contrast, institutional discrimination consists of the day-to-day -day practices of organizations and institutions that have harmful impacts on members of subordinate groups. So this can include things like anti-Semitism. When we think about anti-Semitism, This is going to be where you are acting hostile or exhibiting prejudice towards people who are identifying as the Jewish faith or coming from Israel or who identify as Jews. There's also this notion of Islamophobia, and that's a fear, prejudice, or hostility that's directed towards Islam or Muslims. Let's start breaking apart some of the perspectives that we have on racial and ethnic inequality. So what we're going to be doing in this section is comparing the social, psychological, symbolic, interactionist, functionalist, and conflict perspectives on racial and ethnic inequality. Let's first start with social psychological perspective. When we look at the social psychological perspective on prejudice, this emphasizes psychological characteristics or personality traits. According to the frustration aggression hypothesis, those who are frustrated in their efforts to achieve a highly desired goal tend to respond with a pattern of aggression towards others. When they're unable to strike out at the source of their anger and hostility, they instead may take their hostility and aggression out on a scapegoat. And a scapegoat is a person or a group that's blamed for some problem that causes frustration and is therefore subjected to hostility or aggression by others. People who have an authoritarian personality are characterized by excessive conformity, submissiveness to authority, intolerance, insecurity, a high level of superstition, and rigid stereotypic thinking that are most likely to be highly prejudiced. Let's take a step back for a second. When we think about the social psychological, understand that we are looking at not only how one thinks, but also how that thinking impacts how one feels and how one thinks and feels impacts their behaviors or lack thereof. So when we think about the social psychological perspective, we're looking at things that are very much behavior focused, but behind the behaviors are the thoughts that lead someone to engage in this type of frustration and aggression or conform as opposed to other perspectives. Somewhat related to social psychological explanations of prejudice and discrimination are theories that are based on symbolic interactionist perspectives. One approach emphasizes how racialization contributes to feelings of solidarity with one's own racial ethnic group and hostility towards all others. Racial socialization is a process of social interaction that contains specific messages and practices concerning the nature of one's racial ethnic status as it relates to personal and group identity, intergroup and inter-individual relationship, and one's own position in the social stratification system. Racial socialization influences how people view themselves, other peoples, and the world. Racial socialization may occur through direct statements about race made by parents, peers, teachers, and others. Racial socialization may also include indirect modeling behaviors, which occur when children imitate the words and actions of parents and other caregivers. Racial and ethnic socialization also occurs indirectly through media representation of people in various groups. Now let's look at the functionalist perspective. To functionalists, social order and stability are extremely important for the smooth functioning of society. Consequently, racial and ethnic discord, urban unrest, and riots are dysfunctional and must be eliminated or contained. One functionalist perspective focuses on assimilation. This is the process which members of subordinate racial and ethnic groups become absorbed into the dominant culture. Assimilation is viewed 
as stabilizing forces that minimize differences that otherwise might result in hostility and violence. The most complete form of assimilation is what is called amalgamation. This is the melting pot. This comes from the melting pot model. Amalgamation says that this occurrence happens when members of dominant and subordinate racial ethnic groups intermarry and procreate so-called quote unquote mixed race children. However, early assimilation in the United States focused primarily on the Anglo conformity model, not the melting pot model. Anglo conformity model refers to a pattern of assimilation by whereby members of subordinate racial ethnic groups are expected to conform to the culture of the dominant, meaning white, Anglo-Saxon population. Another functionalist perspective emphasizes ethnic pluralism, the coexistence of diverse racial ethnic groups with separate identities and cultures within a society. Ethnic pluralism in the United States has been based on segregation, the spatial and social separation of people by race or ethnicity, class, gender, religion, or other social constructs. When we look at the conflict perspective, something we need to think about is that the conflict perspective explains racial and ethnic inequality in terms of economic stratification and access to power. The case perspective views racial and ethnic inequality as a permanent feature of the U.S. society. Class perspectives on racial and ethnic inequality highlight the role of the capitalist class in racial exploitation. According to the split labor market theory, the U.S. economy is divided into two employment sectors, the primary sector comprised of higher paid workers in more secure jobs and a secondary sector comprised of lower paid workers in jobs that often involve hazardous working conditions and little job security. A second conflict perspective called gendered racism links racial inequality and gender oppression. Gendered racism is the interactive effect of racism and sexism in exploiting women of color. For many years, jobs in the primary sector of the labor market were held primarily by white men, while most people of color and many white women were employed in secondary sector jobs. Below that tier, in the underground sector of the economy, many women of color have worked in sweatshops or in the sex trade in order to survive. Work in this sector is unregulated and persons who earn their income in it are vulnerable to exploitation. A third conflict perspective examines internal colonialism, a process that occurs when members of a racial ethnic group are conquered or colonized and forcibly placed under the economic and political control of the dominant group. According to sociologist Robert Blonner, groups that have been subjected to internal colonialism remain in subordinate positions in society much longer than those that voluntarily migrated to the country, specifically in this case to the United States. A fourth conflict perspective is the theory of racial formation. From this approach, racial bias and discrimination tend to be rooted in governmental actions ranging from passage of race-related legislation to imprisonment of members of groups believed to be a threat to society. Now that we've gotten these different perspectives um, regarding racism, prejudice, and discrimination under, understood, especially around racial and ethnic inequality, let's dive into talking about specific groups. The first group that we're going to be talking about, the first ethnic group, um, is Native Americans or American Indians and Alaska Natives. So the first thing we need to talk about are colonized migration and genocide. The arrival of the white Europeans changed the Native inhabitants' way of life forever through colonization migration. This is a process whereby a new immigrant group conquers and dominates an existing group in a given geographic area. During these periods of conquest, white European immigrants engaged in genocide, which is the deliberate systematic killing of an entire people or nation. Native Americans, American Indians, and Alaska Natives were also forced into migration and Americanization. After the Revolutionary War in the United States, which ended in 1783, the newly founded federal government negotiated treaties with various Native American nations to acquire additional land for the rapidly growing white population. Even with these treaties in place, 
federal officials ignored boundary rights and gradually displaced Native Americans from their land. Thousands of Alaska Native young people were also removed from their villages and sent to boarding schools far from home, where teachers attempted to purge them of their language and cultural tradition. When we look at some of the more contemporary Native American and, America and Alaska Natives, we need to look at how they've experienced many forms of discrimination. They lost extensive amounts of land to the federal government and to businesses' interests that have not compensated them adequately for their losses. As a result, they have actively opposed mining, logging, hunting, and real estate development on Native lands without permission or compensation. But the losses have gone even deeper for those who believe their culture and their way of life have been stripped away from them. Here we see a picture of a Native American woman who is working on a government-controlled reservation. For her and many like her, they found a new source of revenue through ownership and operation of casinos. However, these casinos have not gone without their fair share of controversy, specifically bringing in an Americanized way onto lands that have once been considered part of a tribe or have been considered sacred. Now let's talk about Black or African Americans. When we think about Black and African Americans, let's first look at slavery and the racial division of labor. Between 1619 and the 1860s, about 500,000 Africans were forcibly brought to North America, primarily to work on Southern plantations. And these actions were justified by the devaluation and stereotyping of African Americans. Even white immigrants benefited from slavery because it provided the abundant raw materials necessary to keep factories running so that they would have jobs. Let's also talk about segregation and lynching. After slavery was abolished in 1863, this division of labor was maintained. De jure's segregation, also known as Jim Crow laws, was the passage of laws that systematically enforced the physical and social separation of African Americans from whites in all areas of public life, including schools, churches, hospitals, cemeteries, buses, restaurants, water fountains, and restrooms. African Americans who did not quote unquote stay in their place were subjected to violence by secret organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan and by lynch mobs. While African Americans in the South experienced du jour segregation, those who migrated to the North experienced de facto segregation. Racial separation and inequality enforced by customs including job ceilings. Because African American men were barred from many industrial jobs, African American women frequently became their family's primary breadwinners. In looking at protests and civil disobedience, let's go back to World War II. During World War II, new jobs opened up for African Americans in northern defense plants after a presidential order was issued prohibiting racial discrimination in federal jobs. After the war, increasing numbers of African Americans demanded an end to racial segregation. The Civil Rights Movement culminated in passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1965, which signified the end of du jour segregation. However, de facto segregation was far from over. In looking at contemporary African Americans, and especially since the 1960s, African Americans have made substantial gains in politics, education, and median income, but the median income that they earn is, is nowhere near what their white counterparts earn, and inequality remains persistent. Black Americans remain significantly underrepresented in the political arena. African Americans are still underrepresented in board level corporate leadership. Blacks comprise 13.6% of the U.S. population, but only 7% of Fortune 500 board seats. A wide disparity exists between the median income of white Americans and that of black Americans. Racially segregated neighborhoods, schools, workplaces, and churches still exist even today. Let's look at Latinx. Remember, Latinx is a gender neutral term for Latino, Latina, or Hispanic Americans. Let's first look at internal colonialism and the loss of land. 
Well, actually, yes. 2000 and 2010, the Latinx population in the U.S. grew by 43%. In 2010, Latinx made up 16% of the total U.S. population. Hispanic Americans have had to contend with internal colonialism and the loss of land, specifically concerning uh, Puerto Rico, Central America, and the U.S. Southwest. In the late 1950s and early 1960, waves of Latinx uh, or Latino and Latina individuals were escaping from Fidel Castro's communist takeover of Cuba and were admitted into the United States as political refugees. Mexicans have been allowed to migrate into the U.S. whenever there's been a need for agricultural workers. However, during times of economic depression or recession in this country, Mexican workers have been excluded, detained, or even deported. When President Donald J. Trump was running for office in 2015 into 2016, his platform included a call for extensive immigration reform, and he's promised to build a massive wall to further restrict the movement across the U.S.-Mexico border. As of today, there are many miles of the wall that has been built, but it hasn't been completed at the time of this video. When we look at contemporary Latinos and Latinas, they comprise of a rapidly growing percentage of the U.S. population. Unemployment is a greater problem for Hispanics and Latinxes than for non-Hispanic whites and the U.S. population as a whole. Problems in employment are intensified by problems in schooling and levels of education attainment among Hispanics in the United States, particularly those who are foreign born. There are better opportunities for education that are needed earlier in life for many Latinx students. Many of them attend low-performing segregated schools in states like California and Texas, where there's less focus on college preparation courses. Latinxes make up more than 80% of public school students in some school districts in California, New Mexico, and Texas. Figure 3.2 looks at the data from 1967 to 2015 of the median household income that's by race and Hispanic origin. And what you'll notice is that being Asian or white, you make significantly more than black and or Hispanic populations. Let's look at Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Americans. The numbers have risen from 1 million in 1960 to more than 17 million in 2010 and constitute about 5.5% of, uh, of the U.S. population. Let's look at immigration and oppression first. Among the first Asians to arrive in this country were Chinese immigrants who, be, who came between 1850 and 1880. Some were fleeing political oppression and harsh economic conditions in China. Others were recruited initially to work the gold fields and mines of California and Nevada, and later to build the Transcontinental Railroad. Almost immediately, anti-Asian stereotypes such as, quote, the yellow peril developed, and employers paid the Chinese laborers far less than white workers. In response to white workers' concerns about cheap labor, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, bringing all Chinese immigrants and immigration to an abrupt halt. This law was not repealed until World War II in the 1940s, when Chinese American workers contributed to the U.S. for effort by working in defense plants. Facing high levels of overt discrimination, many Chinese Americans opened laundries, stores, and restaurants where they primarily did business with each other. However, young, second, and third generation Chinese Americans have left these ethnic niches to live and interact with the general population. Next, we look at internment. Although Japanese Americans experienced high levels of prejudice and discrimination almost as soon as they arrived into this country, their internment in the U.S. concentration camps during World War II remains the central event of the Japanese American experience. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, anti-Japanese sentiment soared in the U.S. Japanese Americans were forcibly removed to concentration camps on remote military bases with barbed wire fences and guard towers, where they remained for more than two years. During their internment, most Japanese Americans lost their residences, businesses, and anything else they had owned. Four decades later, later the U.S. government issued an apology for its actions and agreed to pay restitution. Let's look at colonization. 
A bloody guerrilla war between Filipino islanders and U.S. soldiers followed Spain's surrender of the Philippine Islands, as well as Puerto Rico, to the U.S. in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. When the battle ended in 1902, the United States established a colonial rule, and Filipinos were quote-unquote Americanized by U.S. government-established schools. Filipino Americans were accused of stealing jobs and suppressing wages during the Great Depression. After Philippine independence was granted in 1933, Congress restricted Filipino immigration to 50 persons until after World War II ended in the mid-40s. The newer waves of Asian immigration has been starting since the 1970s. Many Indo-Chinese American refugees have arrived to the U.S. from Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and Laos. Many Vietnamese Americans have become small business owners and ethnic entrepreneurs of establishments such as mail parlors and restaurants. Today, many Asian Pacific immigrants arriving from India and Pakistan are highly educated professionals. Although some immigrants from Korea are also professionals, many have fewer years of formal schooling. In the past, initial contact between Korean Americans and, and Blacks produced conflict, but over time these tensions appear to have dissipated, and some Korean Americans have developed ethnic niches in Koreatowns which are actually multicultural neighborhoods where various racial and ethnic groups interact relatively successfully. Native Americans, excuse me, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders make up more than one and a half million people. This category makes up about 0.2% of the total U.S. population. Because of widespread immigration and high rates of intermarriage, Contemporary Hawaiians include people of virtually every ancestry on earth, including significant numbers of people with Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Korean, and Puerto Rican ancestry. When we look at contemporary Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, they have high educational levels as compared to the overall U.S. population. They are almost twice as likely to have a bachelor's degree as non-Latino or Latina whites. 19% hold an advanced degree. The median income of households in this population category exceed that of non-Latino or Latino whites. Only 12.5% of all Asian and Pacific American families live below the poverty line. What we see here is a picture of a woman who is Asian American and has created an economic niche. So for her, she owns a restaurant or a store that is able to produce money so that her and her family can keep their livelihood. The creation of these economic niches has contributed to the financial survival of many immigrants who are Asian American throughout U.S. history. So finally, is there a solution to racial and ethnic inequality? Let's first look at the functionalist or conservative perspective. For some functionalists, lack of assimilation by recent immigrant groups is a major problem that can be reduced only by heightening legal requirements for entry into the country, as well as for employment and housing, controlling the borders more effectively, and demanding that people become part of the mainstream culture by making English the quote-unquote official language. Functionalists often view schools, families, and churches as being key institutions that should foster achievement in minority youth by helping them to accept dominant U.S. cultural patterns. Conservatives typically view programs such as affirmative action or others that are designed to specifically benefit minority group members as being divisive and harmful. By contrast, functional analysts and conservative political observers believe that individual achievement should be encouraged and highly rewarded. Now let's look at the conflict or liberal solutions. From a conflict perspective, racial and ethnic inequality can be reduced only through struggle and political action. Political intervention is necessary to bring about economic and social change. Discrimination in the workplace must be reduced before racial and ethnic inequality can be eliminated. Solutions to the problem of inequality will be found only through government programs that specifically attack racial inequality and actively reduce patterns of discrimination. Functionalists believe that we have reduced or eliminated affirmative action programs before they have been fully effective in bringing about social change. According to symbolic interactionists, prejudice and discrimination are learned, and that which is learned can be unlearned. 
only individuals and groups at the grassroots level, not government and uh, certainly not political leaders or academic elites, can bring about greater racial equality. Children and young adults should be taught about cultural diversity and American history, and they should also be encouraged to think of positive ways in which individuals of all races can acquire a positive self-concept and interact positively with each other. To reduce racial and ethnic inequality, this is going to require a better understanding of the people across racial and ethnic categories. In order for us to truly find a solution to racial and ethnic inequality, we must recognize the challenges that are poised by increasing racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity and develop a visionary and inclusive perspective so that our nation can meet the challenges of a rapidly changing world in which conflict, terrorism, natural disasters, and geopolitical turmoil are constant sources of the news. I hope that this was helpful for you. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Don't forget to check out the description box below. There's an extra credit question in there for you. All you need to do is answer the extra credit question, take a screenshot, and upload it to the assignment for the week titled YouTube Extra Credit, and you'll get up to one point added to your final grade. Don't forget it's due by Sunday at 11.59 p.m. I hope you have a great one, and until next time, Take care.